many of our students use their talent to serve other people and when they have left us they go on to make a real difference in the communities that they are working within. Many of the people that have been interviewed for this Maiden Teasdale podcast go off to other parts of the country where they make a real difference in the communities that they live. But there are also many students who grow up in Teasdale, attend Teasdale School, and then settle in the Teasdale community and use their talent to enrich the lives of others. And my guest today is certainly an example of that. My name is Simon Henderson. I am Head of History and Sixth Form at Teasdale School. And this is episode 10 of Made in Teasdale. And we actually sat there one night watching John Wayne's stage ghost film projected onto the wall wow. while looking down at the scene below. It, it is absolutely fascinating seeing inner city London children dropped into the middle of a working farm. I have very fond memories of growing up in Teasdale. I mean, living in the countryside and having, well, loads of fresh air, loads of space to play. It really is the case that if you come from County Durham, and, and in my case, have lived in southwest London for 40 years, but County Durham is still what I call home. Made in Teasdale. My guest today is Jo Jones. Although when she was at Teasdale School, she was Jo Bestwood. Jo now works as a teacher at a school for children with special needs in Bishop Auckland. So hello Jo, it's lovely to speak with you. How are you? I'm good, thank you. Nice to speak to you too. Good, thank you for agreeing to do this. Um, Can you talk to me first of all, and talk to our listeners more importantly, about where you grew up in Teesdale and your your early years in the region. Yeah, so I grew up um, outside of Lancaster, about 10, 10 minutes away. Um, first of all, I went to start with primary and then came to Teesdale. Um, and um, obviously stayed until um, A-levels as well, so I did both GCSEs and A-levels there. Tell me about some of your, <laughs> so, tell me about some of your memories of Teesdale School. Um, I remember looking around when my sister sort of was, she's a few years older than me and sort of showed us around on the open day. Um, and I just knew I wanted to, to choose to go to that secondary as well. Um, and I really enjoyed it. The school changed rather a lot while we were there. There was lots of building works and it became a lot bigger. The drama studio was built and um, the technology suite and everything like that. And um yeah, I thoroughly enjoyed the lessons that I did there. Um, sort of good memories of art and, um, and later on, like history and sociology when I was in A-levels, thoroughly um, enjoyed it and had some good laughs along the way. Yeah. Especially in sixth form. <laughs> yes, I, I remember some of those laughs myself. Um, <laughs> so you are now a teacher yourself. Yeah. So talk to us about when you left sixth form about the university you went to how you trained where you ended up where you are now okay I sort of always wanted to be a teacher and then decided at a level that I didn't want to be a teacher and wanted to go and have some life experience and do something different and probably come back to teaching at some point point. Um, so went totally off course from what I thought I would end up doing Um, I thought I'd go to uni and do history and I ended up going and doing police science and had an absolute ball at uni. It was the most um, hands-on, practical um, university course. They were set up like um, CSI scenes that you had to go in and collect the fingerprints and blood splatter analysis and all that sort of thing. It was it was such a good course to do, and I thoroughly enjoyed it. I also worked for two years as a police officer whilst I was down there um, in Wales and thought that that was maybe what I wanted to do and go into child protection within the police um, after two years of doing it and that was definitely not what I wanted to do um, I, it was very fun and, and exciting but also very boring for some of the, the jobs that you had to attend 
and I just didn't want to stay in something I didn't I wanted to work with children and, and I knew that um as soon as I'd sort of done it um but as soon as I came back home after uni um I got some um some experience working in both secondary and primary because I wasn't sure which sort of area I wanted to go into so um I definitely chose primary <laughs> the children are very excitable and and um, they want to learn and, and really eager to, to please you. And I think that's very different to secondary. <laughs> um, so I went to do the skit at Brian Castle um, at, at the primary school there and then sort of had lots of experience in different schools. I worked for two years in mainstream primary um, and I loved the, loved the children there. They were absolutely amazing. Loved, I worked in year one. Um, so teaching the children to read was just such an amazing experience um, but a job came up in a special needs school and that's something I really felt passionately about and um, didn't think I had enough experience but applied anyway and got the job and I've not looked back I wouldn't I love it and I would don't ever want to change my school I just it's, it's such an amazing experience it's so hard and so full-on but it's it's fabulous absolutely fabulous Many people might think that it's it's kind of quite a jump from <laughs> from um, police to yeah. <laughs> to primary school. Some other people might think not. <laughs> but <laughs> what what was it? Do you think about the police that that you just thought it wasn't necessarily as fulfilling as as working with young people? Uh, in one day, I turned up to two different jobs and I knew that day that this was not for me. And, and one of them was a very serious high domestic um, a case where the, the husband had done something horrendous to the woman, uh, ongoing. And um, and it was so satisfying when that went to court and, and he went away to prison. But um, And she she was fantastic. She got her life back and, and she really flourished. But on the same day, we turned up to a, a call about stolen milk bottles and the cost 36 pence. And to try and give that person the same amount of effort um, to what you've just dealt with felt just so wrong um, and induced hours of paperwork that felt pointless. And I just thought, I don't want to spend my life doing a job that half the time is is so fulfilling but the rest of the time feels like a waste of time or or, or pointless because you're never going to catch the person there was no cctv it was just a paperwork exercise and i think what i do now it, you make a difference every single day that you're in in school and um, and i just love that so there's obviously that element of of kind of monotony and feeling as though what you were doing as you said, was a little pointless. You were just kind of going through the motions. But you also yeah. mentioned that really fulfilling case. However, that really fulfilling case strikes me as that sort of thing could quite ha have quite an emotional impact on you. Um, so how did you deal with, you know, I, I know um, I know people who are in the police. I have friends and relatives and they have to see lots of things that you wouldn't want to see. Yeah. How, how did definitely. you cope emotionally with that aspect of the job? Um, you see all sorts. You get so used to to sort of like the worst parts of society, um, that it's sort you sort of glaze over it and sort of get so used to it that it doesn't really affect you as much as maybe an ordinary person. Um, but I think that sort of highlights how bad it actually is that that becomes normal. Um, but also I watch the effects of it had like the the job had on families and basically I, I wanted to become a mum later on in life and, and I met my husband at university as well and he's he want he is now a police officer and and we decided that both of us being one would just have such a detrimental effect on our family in the future that it was really difficult watching people trying to juggle childcare around shifts and coming home and watch you know being watching like a car accident like being in a car um, sort of dealing with car accidents where there was a fatality or something like that and then coming home and, and being with your children was a very difficult thing to sort of comprehend being able to do that later on in life that I just it wasn't really 
my sort of thing. <laughs> no, it's obviously can be pretty harrowing to. I don't think it's something that I could do. That's for sure. So, so the the school that you're working at now, which yeah. school is it? What sort of year group are you teaching? Um, so I work um, in Evergreen Primary in Bishop Auckland. So it's a special needs school that um, is from two years old up to um, eleven, and then we have a secondary school that's um, that's similar. That's part of our um, most of our kids go on to it. So that's the Oaks, and that's from eleven to eighteen. Um, I work in a well at the minute <laughs> I normally work in year one year two but I've actually this year I've got EYFS year one year two and year three yes um but because our classes are grouped in by like need uh, like their needs so my children have profound and multiple learning needs and severe learning needs so we I work with the children with the most sort of severe um, learning needs so a lot of them are in wheelchairs a lot of non-verbal they have things such as epilepsy um so a lot of them have physical needs so um obviously unable to move um unable to walk um their cognition is is very um delayed um yeah it's it's some of my children have like tracheotomies and, and stuff like that. So it's, it's high medical needs. Um, some children are fed through a peg in their stomach. Um, so staff in my classroom are trained to, to do a lot of medical care for them. Um, sort of we're trained to administer emergency medication for epilepsy and, and another obviously meds that they need dearly. Um, and it's a sort of mix between that sort of, then children like that in my class and then I sort of have children that are a little um more able <laughs> at this point in proceedings we were interrupted as Jo's delightful daughter ran into the kitchen from where she was speaking to me and wanted to see what mummy was doing after a small hiatus daddy was summoned to take the little girl into the playroom and we resumed so i would imagine with children with with some of the really severe needs that you're talking about um that can be quite emotionally harrowing as well in in you know in, in a different way to what you were doing in the police yeah it, it can be very very full-on there's been days where it's really sort of been difficult when you're watching children um, who aren't responding to emergency meds and you've got to bring ambulances and, and go to hospital with them. And it's um, full on in a very different way. Um, um, so I've had children that have, that have died as well within the class, um, which is, is sort of what sometimes happens because we've got life limiting um, problems and... and, and it, that's obviously very sad and I've also got children that are so ill that they can't come to school so I go out and teach them at home um, every few weeks and it, it is very difficult but so rewarding when you get a little smile or a um, sort of a movement or something like that. So yeah I would imagine really... that, that those things that we take for granted with children, smiles and, and hugs and and the odd word that they say which is funny or something that they do yeah. I would imagine that that is is something that we we sort of take that for granted so I would imagine that that in the children that you're working with is really priceless yeah I think the tiniest little thing for us is like the biggest achievement and I think you also it makes you appreciate um children's development and um, sort of neural and um, typical children and you realise how incredible the development of a, of a child is and, and how fast they learn. It, it's really amazing. So, yeah, we were talking about the little things. And how, how has your teaching job on a day-to-day -day basis been affected by COVID then? Because there's a lot of remote learning going on. Um, there's a lot yeah. of um, <laughs> online learning, but that I would imagine is not hugely appropriate for the children that you teach. 
No, I wouldn't say it was hugely appropriate. However, government guidelines says that we still have to provide it. So um, we've got, I've got 10 children in my class. Um, as of next week, I've got five children in. Um, so we're, we're sort of working at half capacity. The children that are we're learning from home, um, I've sort of got a plan what, I, what I'm teaching in school. And then I've got a plan individually because their needs are so different um, for the children at home. So we're sending planning out to parents and trying to adapt things. So we do lots of sensory stories. So where we would read a sort of a story, but use sensory props to enhance the children's learning um, and understanding of it. Um, and so we send the, I sort of video myself doing it. And then we send those out to parents to either copy or watch. Um, but again, it, it's very difficult for parents to do that. And, and we're just sort of doing it because the government says we need to um, and hoping that the parents are getting something out of it because obviously it's it's very difficult being a parent at home at the moment and trying to juggle work and um, sort of homeschooling. And with the children that I teach, that the, they also have the medical needs on top of that. Um, and obviously their parents have other children at home that they haven't tried to homeschool as well. And, and I think... Being a special need parent is a very lonely place and a, a, a very difficult place and not a lot of people understand it. So I think the parents are probably quite at the end of the tether, really, and hoping that kids can come back as soon as possible, but obviously not wanting them to, to be in any danger either, which is quite a difficult. Yeah, I would imagine that, that in some, you know, lots of, lots of people rightly suggest that the best place for children to learn is in school. Um, and lots of parents, I think, have got an appreciation of how difficult it is to teach when they're having to do it. But I would imagine that for the sort of children that you're talking about, it, school is a little bit of respite care for the parents as well as actually an education. Yeah. And, and it also gives the children, um, you know, some other people to interact with because um, most children would go to the park or, or have friends that would they would have outside of school. And a lot of um, children don't have that um, aspect and school is that social life as well um, so it, it is it's really important I, I feel for my children to, to be in school but obviously for them the medical needs it's really hard at the minute yeah. now, ha having, having having taught you since you were little uh, and <laughs> all, all the way through to sixth form and I think I know the answer to this question but obviously listeners who might not know you won't know the answer what you're doing your job is really specialized and, and what you're giving of yourself to these children and their families is amazing where do you think that comes from in you where that that you're helping people but you're helping people with very specific needs where where do you think the motivation and where do you think that is where's it come from in yourself? Um, so my parents foster and adopt children and they have, well, over the years I've had lots and lots of children fostered, I think 22. Um, so my home life was very interesting. Um, we had lots of different, beha mainly behavioural, but also um, like uh, disability, uh, children with disabilities as well. So I think I've experienced lots as a child and then I think I thought I don't want anything to do with this as an adult and then got into teaching and thought yeah I definitely do want to give something back and this is something that I really enjoy um when I got given my job in the school I'd never even heard of what PMLD and SLD which is the type of children I, I teach had never even heard of it I didn't understand the the acronym and just went yeah yeah that's great I'd I would love a job there um and I think the first day was an eye-opening experience um and then I was like right let's get stuck in and, and do this properly and I think it's so it is so specialist and so different that I, I learn every single day of oh actually that isn't the best way to do it let's try a different way and, and each child is so different um and each parent is as well and I think you really have to we don't see the parents like you do in a primary school because the children come in from ta on taxis because the children are so widespread. It's not like a normal catchment area. 
So it takes a lot to get the parents to trust you and to, for them to feel comfortable with you looking after their children for such a long period of time. Um, but one of the, my favourite experiences was a, a little girl with Rex syndrome. Um, so we had to feed her because she wasn't able to hold her knife and fork herself. Um, and after lots of research and, and looking around on the internet for things that could support her, we got these really simple like silicon um, attachments to go on knives and forks and paintbrushes and pens and pencils um, and literally asked the head, can we buy them? Yeah, done, bought them. And she was able to feed herself. And that was just such an amazing and incredible experience to watch this child become independent in an area of her life. It was just a tiny bit of silicon that just made such a difference. Obviously, you talk about your 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 growing up and and the impact that your parents have, and I think fostering that many kids and and having such an impact in the lives of that many kids, your parents are pretty amazing people. Um, <laughs> and now you have a little a little one of your own, yeah. And and your mum looks after your little one during the week how this is a difficult question for you to ask should have had a sort of mother and daughter podcast and I could have asked your mum as well but <laughs> having been through that experience of having children herself but then also fostering adopting how 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 do you think that makes having a grandchild more special um how do you think that what what is her reaction towards being able to look after her own grandchild I think she is so dedicated to being such a uh, sort of giving the children, sorry, my sister's got a child as well. So they, they go together. Um, and I think she's so dedicated to giving them like the most amazing experiences um, that she just is so passionate about that. Um, that she just, she is amazing. And, and her way with children is just incredible. Like she just, they flock to her. <laughs> Yeah. Um, and they just love the ex where we live is in the middle of the country well where our parents live in the middle of the country um, and you know there's fields there's animals there's rivers there's just the experiences they get is is like no other they, they would you know it's amazing that she's getting to experience a tiny bit of the childhood I managed to was lucky enough to experience yeah. now you, you moved away you moved away to Wales for a little bit and then you were yeah. working in Wales and and when I taught you, you were Joe Bestford, and uh, the most stereotypical Welsh name you could possibly have is Jones, and now you're Joe Jones. Um, yeah. <laughs> but you've come back to the region, you're back in Teesdale. What do you yeah. think it is about Teesdale that you missed? What do you think it is about Teesdale that makes you want to set up a life, the rest of your life there, or certainly a large part of your adult life? I think as a teenager when, you know, doing A-levels and things, I think I wanted to get as far away from Barney and, and the the lack of things that you can do there as, as a teenager. And I couldn't wait. And I think I went to the furthest away university I could possibly find that did my course. Um, but when I looked around the universities, there was Preston and, and other ones down south that were very much city-based Um and I just looked around and felt depressed, I think, from just the lack of greenery and um, and went to this one in South Wales and it was set in the Welsh hills and um, 20 minutes away from Cardiff. So you got that city life when you wanted it, but it was still beautiful views when you looked out of your window. Um, and I just knew I wanted to go there as soon as I walked up this massive hill and, and just knew that that's where I wanted to go. Um, but after three years, I was definitely ready to come home and, and I knew that I wanted to set up family um, around where, where I grew up. Um, I think for me, it was important to live in sort of like a village and, and, and have that sort of rural life for my children as well. Um, so that was sort of like a big, a big push. Um, but I don't think I necessarily chose to come here. It just sort of happened. Life it just happened. <laughs> so we've got a lot of um, our own students who are obviously working from home during lockdown. We've got a lot of parents who are trying to help them learn from home during lockdown. Um, what advice could you give them in terms of trying to stay motivated, trying to 
you were a very dedicated student and a very um sort of disciplined learner from, uh, and you were sort of very independent in your learning not everybody has that gift what what advice would you give people to try and stay focused to try and get the most out of online learning i think don't overpower like overwhelm yourself with what you have to do write down a list you know do it little and often where jump into it do a little bit go and do something for yourself um I, i'm one of those people that work with you do do what you have to do and then the rest of the time you've then got to enjoy it whereas i know other people prefer to sort of do what they like to do and then have squish all the bits in um late at night or whatever but i was always the other way around i like I like getting it, everything i have to get done done and then i can enjoy i get the most out of my time because i can then enjoy where i'm not needing to do stuff but i think you've also got to be happy and just make sure you're doing what you can do and don't over pressurize yourself good advice and and when you've done all the things that you have to do and you've got them all done you've ticked them off your little list um and you've got a bit of time to relax and a bit of downtime what 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 film or book and or album recommendation could you put out there for people to explore in their chill time i think as a parent i don't get a lot of chill time now but um <laughs> prior to that <laughs> i would um i would definitely recommend the book thief it's one of my favorite books um it's it's a fabulous read and, and to watch it. It's a good film as well. Um, but yeah, I, I, I like things that are to do with history and I, I sort of, the Tattooist of Auschwitz is another one that I really enjoy. Um, but since having children, I've read about three books in three years. So <laughs> it's not something that I, I do as often as I'd like to now. Um, but there's lots of things out there. So go and have a look on Facebook or on whatever I've managed to join an art course for the next six weeks to do an adult art course that's fully funded. So you get sent a massive pack of stuff and do something that makes you happy. Just chill. <laughs> Very good advice. Do for, for life, really. Do something that makes you happy and chill. That, that should be on a t-shirt or something <laughs> um, well thanks very much for your time joe uh, i've really enjoyed catching up with you and i'm sure our listeners will enjoy um the podcast thanks really nice catching up as well there's someone with a real heart for helping other people for giving of herself to to do something amazing for some children with some very specific needs and I am sure that parents of those children and in time those children themselves will realize how lucky they are to have people like Joe who are so committed to caring for them, educating them and helping them to get the best out of life that they can. If you have a story that you would like to share with the Made in Teasdale listeners, or you know somebody else who you think has a story that would be good for this podcast, then please do get in touch. Until next time, stay safe, take good care. Goodbye. <laughs>